Namaha. For today's transcendentalists claiming a link to His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada, the root consideration continues to be sincerity. How important is sincerity? Is sincerity of intention and presentation integral for those devotees leading or part of any organization claiming to represent Prabhupada's branch of Krishna consciousness? Now, as most of you know, a synonym of sincerity is honesty, a quality specifically listed in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita for Brahmins. When devoted transcendentalists are sincere, they are honest men and women. Was Prabhupada's movement specifically formulated and formed to create Brahmins? The bona fide guru is sincere, and he is the best of the Brahmins. The bogus guru is not sincere. There has been and continues to be a massive proliferation of bogus gurus throughout the world at this time. Most of them present themselves as Vaishnavs, and at least in one case, a Vaishnavi. The insincere presentations are threefold, as most of you know. Two of them are represented by bogus Diksha gurus. The other one is represented by anachronistic Ritvik Acharyas who can be compared to gurus coming through the back door. All of these so-called gurus conduct initiation ceremonies and allegedly create Brahmins in the process, but none of them recognize those Brahmins from the other camps. None of them will allow other, air quotes, Brahmins to perform worship ceremonies on their altars. Now, this last mentioned camp of Acharyas, divided, heavily divided into opposing factions, is known as Ritvik. We have discussed and written about this group many times. The root issue for them centers around whether or not spiritual seekers coming into some kind of first contact in the aftermath of Prabhupada's physical manifestation, whether those seekers can claim an initiation now from him. Those of these newcomers who are sincere who came to knowledge of and about him later, accept him as Shiksha Guru. Those who are insincere falsely allege that he can be their Diksha Guru, which definitely he cannot be, despite ceremonies performed in order to create the impression, the false impression, that he is. An early summary is this. For those who are sincere, they secure a spiritual master by the grace of Krishna. Yet for those who want to be cheated, Krishna will send them a cheater or a cheating system, spouting pseudo-devotional nonsense. They will thus, barring a divine intervention provided by providence, be cheated for the rest of their lives. This cheating is going on. In the cults of so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Ritvik, it has gone on for decades. It has been going on in the name of Prabhupada. It continues to go on because it has a willing clientele, which continually energizes it. They are the cheated. The cheaters also come in many forms. Some declare themselves to be initiating spiritual masters, but their claim is found out to be hollow when researched. That research is readily available to the sincere, and the internet is a boon in this connection. Some of the aforementioned clientele, the insincere seekers, want an institutional guru. The fabricated so-called ISKCON provides this for them in spades. Others want something different. 
Many of them, due to great misfortune, become attracted to Gaudium mud. These people have not done their required research. As such, some of them, the most unfortunate of the lot, wind up with a Neomat guru. They wanted to be cheated in that way, and material nature readily provides them a Neomat wild card. Some of the insincere, on the other hand, want to claim that they are initiated disciples of Prabhupada, although they only came to the burnt remnants of what was once his branch much later. On the rebound, that led them to being attracted by Ritviks, all of whom possess no authority whatsoever to perform initiation rituals on behalf of Prabhupada. Now, these unfortunates, they pick up, or they picked up on how so-called ISKCON is bogus. Frustrated, they insist that the founder of that once bona fide movement can now still be their Diksha Guru. That they spot and spotted the deviation and insincerity of so-called ISKCON and its leaders is laudable. However, when they pour the key of that realization upon the ashes of a concoction, one which affords them the illusion of a Prabhupada initiation, they are no longer eligible for any commendation. In his book, Civilization and Transcendence, in chapter 7 of that book, the chapter entitled Getting Spiritual Guidance, Prabhupada wrote the following, quote, The guru is essential, but why go to a bogus guru? You will be cheated, unquote. Pushing historical revisionism and mistaken knowledge these acts are harmful to anyone pursuing spiritual life. From one perspective, they can be and should be categorized, all of them, as bogus gurus. This includes the postmodern Ritvik Acharyas, despite the fact that they do not claim to be a Diksha Guru, of the unfortunates they lure into their scam. Accepting Prabhupada as Shiksha Guru, that's essential. All of his genuinely initiated disciples, in other words, those who were and are actually his Diksha disciples, they also all accept him as Shiksha Guru. All newcomers to his branch of the Chaitanya line can also accept him as Shiksha Guru. Indeed, they must do so. The word, the Sanskrit word Acharya, although it has varied applications, is predominantly known as a synonym of guru. The Ritvik Acharya was not in this category, however. He was a priest. His validity in conducting initiation ceremonies on behalf of the physically manifest spiritual master who must appoint him to do so means that he is nothing more than the master of ceremonies of the initiation fire sacrifice, which is a Vedic ritual. However, today's so-called Ritvik Acharyas are acting as bogus gurus. A physically manifest genuine guru has not recognized any of them to conduct these ceremonies. That they are doing so is a display of cheating especially when they claim, which they all do, to be doing so on Prabhupada's behalf. As such, again, we have three divisions of bogus Vaishnavs acting as gurus, the institutional gurus of so-called ISKCON, the Neomat wild cards, and the Ritvik Acharyas. In this case, unlike before, these last mentioned Acharyas are no longer Ritviks. In point of fact, many of them never were Ritviks even when Prabhupada was manifest, but they are now all pretenders within the category of bogus acharyas, or in other words, they are also all bogus gurus. Now, the question may be justly raised as to the causal principles involved in today's massive proliferation of bogus gurus and cheated disciples. The chief causal principle is the killer creeper of so-called ISKCON. 
Dishonesty is intrinsic to it and always has been. As brought forth in last month's presentation, this killer creeper first developed in 1974 as a competitor to the actual threat of the Hare Krishna movement at that time, which it eventually murdered. The Hare Krishna movement of Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada's branch of the Chaitanya tree, was growing very well and strong from the late 60s onwards. The killer creeper was meant to strangle it. While Prabhupada was physically manifest, it could not do so, although it was negatively impacting his real movement during his final years. We find this room conversation with a media interview in 1973 in London. Interviewer, do you think there are many phony gurus? Prabhupada, it is not that because there is some counterfeit money, there is no genuine money. Both of them are there. You simply have to select whether one is counterfeit or not. I may give you a hundred dollar note, but if you do not know what is genuine, you will be cheated. By no later than 1975, Prabhupada's initiated disciples, those who were engaged in intense service to him, were informed within themselves through the agency of pragya, higher intelligence, that something wrong was taking place in his movement. There was something counterfeit developing in it, but none of them could put all of the pieces of the puzzle together at that time. Now, we all have enough knowledge and recorded history in order to do so. Bogus gurus come in many varieties, but in the opinion of your host speaker, the worst of the bunch is the bogus Vaishnava guru. There were 11 of them in the late 70s and they created a zonal monopoly throughout the world at that time. As such, only Sahajias represented that institution, the air quotes ISKCON institution for all of those years. And this fact is indisputable. So ask yourself these questions. With only bogus gurus doling out tainted instructions and guidance to improperly initiated disciples for basically a decade, what can possibly become of that organization? Even when the colossal hoax was fully exposed and upended, the needle in and the damage done. After such a massive, catastrophic uh, era, which negatively impacted everyone, can it still be conducive, that organization, to spiritually elevating its remaining members? Can it still imbue in them deep-seated honesty when the whole thing was based on dishonesty? In the aftermath of such massive destruction, can such an institution be considered sincere? Or is the reflection you receive from it by looking into its funhouse mirrors nothing more than pseudo-spiritual? The killer creeper did what it was meant to do, and there have been no genuine gurus in that thing for decades. Bogus gurus and improperly initiated disciples laughing at their reflections in the funhouse mirror does not constitute real Ananda. All the unfortunates, the fools, the true believers, the kickmes, the space cadets have been involtuated by killer creepers transmitted from bogus gurus. They are basically institutional gurus and the party men set the scene for the show. So-called ISKCON is a prop. It is colored water in a bottle which is advertised as medicine for a spiritual cure but when you drink it that love potion turns out to be anything but. Instead 
you get poisoned. You soon enough become addicted to the air quotes ISKCON funhouse. And Kali Yuga creates a myriad of concoctions and sense gratifications meant for your degradation into absurdity and oblivion. Welcome to the Hindu dance troupe and the whirling dervishes of egotistical sweaty show bottle kirtans with drums and cymbals. You get cheated, but you wanted to be cheated. In the mid-70s, the Hawaii Center was in some turmoil. The temple president, unknown to most of the parishioners, was an active homosexual. He would soon enough die from AIDS. At the same time, a charismatic sannyasi who regularly surfed and made his contempt of Sanskrit well known was considered by some to be the real authority. His Divine Grace frequented the Honolulu Yatra quite often. Prabhupada liked the tropical environment. He even considered it heavenly. There was a rather rare Q&A session after a platform lecture there in the Hawaii temple room. And one female disciple said to Prabhupada that she was an unintelligent woman. She could not discern who was the actual authority in Hawaii who was representing Prabhupada. She asked him to tell her who to follow so that she would not be cheated. This anecdote that I'm relaying right now was told to me by her in the 80s. Prabhupada's reply to her was, quote, dull-witted must be cheated. I am pleased. Krishna is pleased. Why are you displeased? Unquote. And we find this excerpt from a platform lecture in Bombay dated November 28, 1974. Quote, Therefore, tad vigyan artang sagrum eva If you want to learn about that, then you must find out a guru. What kind of guru? Just like Kapiladev, Krishna, or his representative. Not a bogus guru. Then you will be cheated, unquote. It is mandatory to accept a spiritual master if you want liberation but he must be accepted in the right way. Accepting Prabhupada in the right way at this time means to accept him as Shiksha Guru. That is his availability, but he will not guide you if you wrongly accept him now as Diksha Guru, which he cannot be for you. He will also not be able to guide you if you fall for so-called ISKCON and its current unauthorized transformation. He will not be able to guide you if you approach those who betrayed him by crossing the river and forming Neomat, those Neomat gurus are all traitors, and Prabhupada is not available to you there. Prabhupada is not a bogus guru. Every so-called guru in so-called ISKCON is a bogus guru. They do not all claim to be gurus in that organization, of course. However, the party men in the thing buttress their institutional gurus and as such are somewhat culpable for misleading the unfortunates who enter that institutional vortex and are thus strangled by the killer creeper within it. All of the Neomat gurus are bogus gurus, no exception. A genuine guru does not preach the Upasiddhanta that the Jivatma originated from an impersonal source. He does not preach that the Jivatma has never been in the spiritual world. All of the Neomat gurus, without exception, they preach this. And their affiliation in style, in mood, in conduct, and in preaching, their affiliation with Gaudiya in these ways was specifically forbidden by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. As mentioned before, Today's Ritvik Acharya is a kind of backdoor guru. Ritvik is no longer viable as a system of initiation. Prabhupada is not here to appoint Ritviks to initiate on his behalf. 
He is no longer a Diksha Guru. These Ritviks mislead so many people into believing something which is entirely anti-Vedic and anti-Vaishnav, absorbed in a complete concoction. Ritvik is highly centrifugal. One prominent Ritvik in South India accepts Uttama Adhikari worship. What a laugher that is. Some on the other side of the spectrum assert that once they perform the ceremony, that new disciple, allegedly now initiated by Prabhupada, that new disciple is just as good as the so-called Ritvik Acharya who performed the ceremony himself. When it comes to all the various Ritvik cults and their Back to Prabhupada magazine, note also how antagonistic they are to one another. Consider how they have no solid evidence to back up their scam. Note that many of these Ritvik Acharyas are just like bogus gurus. In other words, once they make a disciple, quote-unquote, for Prabhupada, allegedly, they're only creating the duped Yajamana for themselves. When it comes to Ritvik, absurdity's horse adorns the sky. Tatvamasi. Unauthorized bhakti yoga is just as bogus as unauthorized meditation and or gymnastic methods of yoga. Taking a cruise with any of these is like boarding a boat of stone, and that ship will drown all its passengers very quickly. You must at least have enough sense to test a prospective guru in order to find out who is a spiritual master and who is not. This entails study of absolute philosophy as revealed in the scriptures, as well as research into the history of the so-called guru, along with the history of his institutional affiliation. If you are going to purchase something, you must at least have some idea of what that thing is. Otherwise, you will be cheated. Boarding a stone boat which falsely advertises itself as a vehicle to achieve liberation constitutes a dreadfully bad decision leading to an even worse ending. All's well that ends well? Sure. However, the other side of the aphorism is just as true. All's hateful that ends badly. So-called Iskan, Neomut, and Ritvik are all going to end badly, and they all deserve to be hated. If your fault-finding mind says, no negativity, please consider two facts. First, that quasi-sutra of no negativity is comprised of only two words both of which are unequivocally negative. Secondly, Prabhupada criticized other so-called gurus during his, his de decade-plus of preaching in the West. And as often as not, he named names when doing so. Have you forgotten this? He criticized Mahesh Yogi by name. Concerning the boy guru, Prabhupada denounced Maharaj G by name, declaring, quote, You've got to decide whether he is a god or a dog. He is cheating people, but he will be cheated in a bigger way, unquote. Sure enough, everything collapsed in a big way for the little fellow shortly afterwards. Why are we to be chastised? for following in our spiritual master's footsteps. He criticized cheaters, and he named names. We do not go out of our way or go overboard in naming names, but sometimes it's required to do so. In those cases, we thus do so. The genuinely initiated disciples of Prabhupada, and by that I mean those initiated by him between and during 1966 through and including 1977, those initiated disciples 
have a right to clearly state which groups are cheating people at this time. And as far as that goes, it's not merely a right, it's our duty. In the Science of Self-Realization, Prabhupada writes, quote, You may like to eat meat. I hate it. How can your standard of happiness be equal to mine? Unquote. Is Prabhupada to be criticized for hating something? Should not an Uttamadakari not hate? If you reply that it's an example of hating the sin and not the sinner, then consider this excerpt from a letter to two of his vacillating disciples in India early in his movement dated January 31st, 1969, quote, He has no actual spiritual asset. For spiritual advancement of life, we must go to one who is actually practicing spiritual life, not to some head of a mundane institution, not to one who has offended his spiritual master in so many ways. I do not wish to go into all details here, but I must inform you that this Ban Maharaj may be considered as a black snake. And at the time of his disappearance, my Guru Maharaj did not even wish to have him in his presence." Unquote. At that time, back there in early 1969, Prabhupada's disciples, those two disciples, were wavering and they were being preached to by Ban. In point of fact, one of them renounced his initiation for Prabhupada and took a, a newly initiated name from Ban, which is highly offensive. But herein, referring to the excerpt just read, Prabhupada refers to that elder godbrother, Ban, as a black snake. Sounds quite personal to me. Does not sound like he loved him very much. Uh, also, Prabhupada called one of his personal secretaries a black snake. It was in a letter which was not included in the folio for some reason, at least I'm unable to locate it in there. This devotee, one of his initiated Brahmins, traveled with Prabhupada and handled the secretarial duties. He thus was in daily personal contact with Prabhupada. However, in Vrindavan, that secretary came into contact with Arasa Babaji. As most of you know, Prabhupada and his own spiritual master forcefully rejected these charismatics. Just after that secretary left his direct service to Prabhupada, that secretary then adopted the philosophy and bhakti procedures from that so-called Rasagu. As a result, Prabhupada specifically referred to him as a black snake in a letter to one of his other leading secretaries. As such, to hate the sin and not the sinner is much less applicable in our process than it may seem. Nobody except the pure devotee knows anybody ultimately. But you do not engage in close contact with a crocodile in order to allegedly preach to that entity's pure spirit soul within the dreadful body it inhabits. We need not shrink in this connection. We need not take a completely impersonal outlook of what went down in the spring of 1978. Nor should we dismiss obvious culpability on the plea that they were over-exuberant young boys, completely sincere in what they ultimately failed to pull off. They were not at all sincere. They were instead egregiously deviant. Prabhupada said, quote, regular guru, that's all, unquote. He did not appoint any initiating gurus, not officially. He left the post open, but he limited it by applying that adjective, regular. And Uttamadakari is not a regular guru. Nothing whatsoever can regulate him in any way. A guru who has achieved the status of Raganuga is also beyond regulation. In other words, he's also not a regular guru. The conclusion, obvious logical conclusion, is that Prabhupada did not see any of his disciples qualified to be even a regular guru, so in advance 
he imposed the regulatory stricture. If a guru did emerge, he would simply be a matyam, udhikari, acting under regulative principles, regulatory, regular guru, as long as he first received the order from Prabhupada to actually initiate. Certainly, that official order was never given. It was never given to any of the 11 Ritviks. It was never given to them in total. This fact is indisputable. What to speak of the historical fact also beyond dispute, that they all imitated the Mahabhagavat in complete and egregious defiance of the order not to do just that. Do you hate that sin? It literally was a death blow to Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement. Your host speaker certainly hates it. What about those who committed that hateful deviation? They were all under the thraldom of Mahamaya within the influence of the personality of Kali. Do you have any obligation to even be slightly fond of them? As far as GBC responsibility is concerned, it is more than merely tangible. So-called ISKCON now has the astral smell of dying roses with the stem attached, and those thorns are just as sharp today as they were in yesteryear. The vitiated GBC is culpable for the current situation. The zonal acharya scam was non-different from the GBC decision to authorize it. All of those zonals were GBCs. Once the GBC resolved to create zones for each of them, the whole movement was deviated to its core. For those still allured by today's so-called ISKCON, thinking that they will experience a slice of heaven by entering its realm, their actual experience will soon shatter that idyllic illusion. The mythic vision of an oasis retreat from the nasty outside world, that retreat, that vision only lasts so long. It once was so, but that was a long time ago. The picture of an ideal Brahminical society will soon enough be disrupted unless you willingly allow yourself to become part of the myth itself. Despite some of them being, you could say, materially beautiful, there are no saints in so-called ISKCON, but there are plenty of swindlers. The image projected by that organization is not the reality experienced. So-called ISKCON is not a conduit to anything more gratifying than the warped illusions of its funhouse, in no small part because the killer creeper not only still resides in it, but is the very sinew of its astral egregor. Juxtaposed to the outside world, there are certainly differences between it and the outside world, but ultimately you will discover, unless you want to be cheated, that its institutional gurus both represent and spread an evil of their own. It is not an institution you should enter. Whether bona fide or not, and so-called ISKCON is certainly in the latter category, any Eastern cult which is apparently integrated to some extent into the Western milieu, will appear foreign, at least to some extent. East is West in so-called ISKCON, however, and never the twain shall meet became obsolete upon its emergence. This is because the West was the best. The West was the winner in its competition to pollute and overcome so-called ISKCON. It was already winning before Prabhupada disappeared from material manifestation, 
After that, starting in the spring of 1978, the Western world won in a rout. Another way of saying the same thing is that so-called ISKCON is at root a Western entity and leftist as well, coated with a thin Eastern veneer mixed with Hinduism. There are shadowy and strange aspects to it, but these can only be perceived by intuitive and sincere seekers of the absolute truth. The longer you choose to stay in it, the greater your ability will be to spot its dark underbelly, that is, unless you become corrupted by it. There is a great deal of spiritual risk in taking such a path of direct experience. However, better just to pass through and better than that, not to enter it at all. There is no need to dismiss the warnings you receive here as nothing more than belly aching or fault finding. Criticism of that which is not does not fall into the category of complaint. Let me repeat that, please. Criticism of that which is not does not fall into the category of complaint. They're different. Your host speaker is not complaining about any of the three deviant groups touched upon in this video. There is also no complaint in this quarter for what has gone down and what it has produced. It was what it was, it is what it is, and they are what they are. They exist for a reason. There is no need to lament or complain about their existence, and we do not do so. There is no need to complain about them whatsoever. The real need is to expose them and exposing so-called ISKCON in order to reverse its momentum has nothing to do with belly aching. Complaining is not the same thing as hating something. It is incumbent upon you to recognize that difference in order to assimilate this presentation to your advantage today. By assimilating it, you will no longer remain in the category of the unsuspecting unlike thousands before you. You will no longer be forced to take action only after experience, as instead you can act by hearing. You do not require to endure the psychic pummeling of disillusionment, the product of unnecessary experience. The complex networks and threads within the so-called ISKCON institution do not need to first be fully understood by experience in order to fully transcend them. You can transcend them by hearing. So-called ISKCON beckons you to believe that what it offers is a spiritual experience, but it does not come as advertised. There's a lot of covert stuff that goes on behind the scenes in that particular cult but such is the case with any pseudo-spiritual deviation. Its plot threads are mostly in-house, and whatever lurks behind the institutional curtain can be avoided. You best avoid it by simply not entering its theater. Ultimately, so-called ISKCON exists within a backdrop that is both eerie and surreal. Yet it, it's quite expert at disguising this. Its superficial presentation appears to be exactly opposite of the weird. You could say it has perfected that pretense to a significant extent. Nevertheless, know it for a fact that so-called ISKCON has a very dark side, that un aforementioned underbelly permeating all of its distortions, all of its reflections, in those mirrors, those fun mirrors, in combination with the Hindu rituals and festivals, the community which subsidizes it, dominated by Western Hindus at the current time, approves of its witch's brew of mystique and alleged spiritual authority. So do not be fooled by any of that. You're being warned about it now. 
if you make the risky decision to explore it from within, you enter into what can be considered by you to be uncharted territory, although most of that has been charted and explained before by others. Therefore, it's accessible in that way. The nature of so-called ISKCON cannot be gleaned within it via its own historical revisionism. You will certainly be misled by that. But outside of that, there are plenty of warnings available to you. You're listening to one of them now. You're watching one of them now. Look into those warnings. They are there to help you. The message is the medium in this case, as Paramatma has arranged to protect you through his online facilitation. So-called ISKCON is inherently unstable. It can crumble at any time. When it actually begins to do so, it could crater fast. It is built upon a foundation of sand. And that sand is made up of compromise and defiance of Prabhupada's orders. The legacy of so-called ISKCON is one of meta-deception. Today, also spiked with a kind of Hindu pop culture in the guise of Vedic celebration. It has become an odd movement. There is a great deal of imagination in it. And, if you're a bit intuitive, there is also a kind of ghostly haunt pervading it, that ghostly haunt suffused with a whiff of the uncanny. Arthur Schopenhauer wrote about the will to live being the underlying drive pushing all of humanity. Denying metaphysics, Nietzsche took things to another level as he wrote about der will zur Macht, the will to power. This has to be transcended by all genuine transcendentalists and that certainly includes devotees. In Prabhupada's book, Beyond Illusion and Doubt, in chapter 12, we find the following excerpt, quote, Envy is a symptom of conditioned life. In this material world, everyone is envious. People are even envious of God and his instructions. Consequently, people do not like to accept Krishna's instructions. This envy is symptomatic of conditioned souls. Unless we are liberated from conditioned life, we will remain confused under the influence of the external material energy. Until we come to the spiritual platform, there is no possibility of escaping from envy and pride by so-called willpower, unquote. For those of you who have studied Nietzsche, he put an emphasis on willpower and he also utterly denigrated and eschewed humility. Now, in Sanskrit, the will to power is called Ishvarapava. It is found in Bhagavad Gita in the verse immediately following the quality of honesty being listed as integral to the Brahmin. It's not integral to the warrior. In other words, Ishvarapava is the quality of the warrior. He is, according to Vedic stricture, inferior to the Brahmin and is meant to accept the Brahmin's advice. Nietzsche opines that the warrior is far superior to the effete intellectual, who he despises. That is Nietzsche's concept, and it's entirely Western, just as much as it's entirely anti-Vedic. It was the will to power Derville Zermatt, that drove those 11 zonals to convert Prabhupada's movement into their own playground. There should not be the slightest surprise that dishonesty, meta-deception, was underlying it from the summer of 1977 onward. It was the will to power that drove Ocean's 11 to overlord all of their god brothers and god sisters in that unauthorized zonal escapade. While pretending to be the best of the Brahmins, they acted 
in a quite contradictory and imperfect way, they acted as warriors, wolves in sheep's saffron. It was Derville Zermatt, the will to power, combined with immeasurable audacity, that drove those 11 hateful men to imitate the Mahabhagavat in every conceivable way. One of these ways included concocted monikers, cheap imitations of the Prabhupada title, the master at whose feet all other masters sit. It was the will to power that drove them to employ meta-deception in their presentation of the so-called facts and history of their killer creeper. Their whole presentation was the big lie. And it imbued within them the overconfidence that would not be immediately discovered. And it wasn't. These deceptive acts are those of warriors, fighters in the mode of passion, crushing everyone who stood in their way. They ousted, one way or another, those who were unable to snap and crack at their influence from the outset. All those 11 men were obviously fully under the influence of material energy throughout their drive to take over the movement, which they did for a while. Ask yourself this question. How can any sane person claim that those men were not driven by envy of Prabhupada via that zonal imposition? Schopenhauer wrote, quote, Life is war, a fight to find happiness, unquote. Nietzsche took the baton from his fellow German philosopher and he went further with it. He glorified war. We all know this. He maintained that the only way to produce great men was through war, offering Napoleon and Bismarck as his prime examples. He believed that only the Ubermensch could evolve from a great hero who must be a great, passionate man of war. However, please note, Prabhupada viewed the Ubermensch differently from dialectical spiritualism in his critique of Nietzsche. Prabhupada wrote, quote, Everyone is trying to be a great man, but once greatness is genuine, when he becomes God realized. The word Veda means knowledge, and a person is great when he is conversant with the lessons of the Vedas. The point is that anyone can take advantage of the Vedic instructions, become a superman or ubermensch, and go back to Godhead. Unquote. Now, let us admit the Brahmin and the sannyasi have the inside track of becoming this great man in the true sense of the term, the sense of the term just described by Prabhupada. These saintly and honest men do not want war, and they do not incite it. Prabhupada did not write any manuscript glorifying war, but he did write a different book with a very opposite theme, that book, by the way, was entitled The Peace Formula. Now ask yourself this question. What did those 11 great pretenders bring us? Answer, they brought us constant strife. They brought us instability, leading to contentiousness and opposition, and this eventually produced two major splinter groups, ultimately just as deviant as their cult. They brought us meta-deception, which, when finally discovered, simply led to more disturbance. In summary, they set the movement on fire and brought us war. What were those 11 pretenders? And who were they actually following? They were all GBCs, as we know, and the commission was formulated formed and chartered to consist 
only of Brahminical advisors to the temple presidents. After his departure from the material plane, were those 11 men following Prabhupada? Were they following his orders about how the movement was to continue in his absence? Or instead, were they imitation warriors in the guise of fully God-realized spiritual masters, pretenders who were actually following the teachings of somebody else? The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. It is loaded with funhouse mirrors. You never see anyone in it for who he or she truly is. Neither do you see yourself in the right way there. Instead, if you remain in that bad association, you unwittingly enter into its slavocracy via the killer creeper it transmits through its bogus gurus. What the worst of them did back in the late 70s and the first half of the 80s with plenty of fellow travelers and henchmen was a cataclysmic abomination that is still fully present in today's transformed product. It was and remains a detestable make show. If you choose to hate them for what they did, you will hear no complaint from me. Sadeva Samya.